Hello and welcome to our fifth lecture in Module 4 on short-term and working memory. Previously we've been talking about just an introduction to Baudelaire's model of working memory and then we just did of course the phonological loop and now we're moving into talking about the visual spatial sketch pad. In our next lecture we'll talk about the central executive and uh, executive attention as a model of working memory. But first let's get started on talking about the visual spatial sketch pad. So the visual spatial sketch pad is of course a key component of uh, Baudelaire's model of working memory. It's uh, involved in uh, storage and manipulation of uh, visual spatial information, well primarily storage. The manipulation of course occurs in the central executive. So the visual spatial sketch pad stores a limited amount of visual and spatial information it also stores visual information encoded from verbal descriptions. So this is when you're reading a novel and trying to picture what's happening. That uh, visual information, as we're trying to picture it uh, from that verbal description, is uh, occurring in the visual spatial sketch pad. Other things you might think about uh, being similar, let's say your, your roommate went out to a look at furniture and they're for some reason didn't think to take a picture so they were trying to describe what it looked like or they were trying to describe someone they saw today. Um, that picture that you're getting in your head is in the visual spatial sketch pad. Um, so there are a number of uses of, of the visual spatial sketch pad and one of the first things uh, I want to talk about is that a number of tasks that we're going to talk about um, people will sometimes not use the best strategy. So because we are pretty verbal, we're verbal and visual creatures, but a lot of what we're used to doing is working with, in particular, if we're thinking about manipulating information, doing math in our head, we tend to do that. We tend to talk our way through it. Um, and so sometimes if you push people to use only visual information, you can actually improve their performance. And so this is one of those very rare instances where adding another task actually improves performance on a different task. So in this pretty clever study, um, participants were given a picture of something like this. This is my version. This didn't come from their um, original um, work, but this is what I came up with. Um, and I think they did something like this, but uh, the original picture they were given would be something like this. Now they're told then to mentally subtract this portion, um, and then they were asked, what does it look like? They weren't shown this image over here, but this is what they were supposed to picture looking like in their head. So they're presented with the original picture and then asked to mentally subtract that portion. What's really interesting about this is that participants were actually better with articulatory suppression. So in the previous lecture we talked about an articulatory suppression task like saying the, 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 the over and over again. In this case, doing that pushed participants into a visual strategy where they couldn't talk their way through it because they were busy already in that articulatory suppression task. So it forced them into using a visual representation. Um, and that's a really interesting um, result because that clearly indicates that these are independent components. That is, one is not interfering with the other. In fact, it's quite the opposite. By keeping the phonological loop busy, they were able to force participants into using uh, a visual strategy and actually improve their performance. Uh, there are a number of different types of visual spatial tasks and I think this will help you get a flavor for exactly what kinds of things in your life you've been doing that are visual spatial tasks that you don't uh, think about. The first uh, task that we use in a laboratory, one of the sort of older tasks in this area, is called the mental rotation task. Um, and this is some examples from the Vandenberg and Kuse test of mental rotation. And so the task here, uh, this original version was a pencil and paper task. It's a timed task. Um, and so I think it's two minutes for each um, section of the uh, test, as I recall. I, it's been a long time since I've actually done this. Um, but basically, participants are given this model here. And then they're asked to indicate which of these which two of these are the same object rotated to a different view. So you have to mentally picture what it looks like to turn this 
object to a different view. So this one here is a match, and this one here is a match, so the first and third. So we come down to this object, and as I recall, it's the same answers that are correct. Yeah, so it's the first and third again. So you have to mentally rotate that kind of image. Um, <clears throat> and so what you're trying to do then is mentally rotate that image, which is why it's called the mental rotation task. Uh, this is one of the tasks we'll talk about uh, later on the, in the term. We talk about gender and cognition. Uh, this is one of the tasks that there is in many studies, a strong gender split. That is, males tend to be better at this than females, but there's some also some interesting work we'll also get to showing that that may be mediated by uh, the hormone testosterone. That is, if you give young college-age women testosterone, they actually get better at this task. Um, and so there's some really interesting uh, stuff going on in that area. This is one of those areas, again, where, in general, men tend to be better at this task than women. There are plenty of tasks that we'll get to that women are better at as well. Uh, but that is, we're talking about mean group differences, not any individual. Any one individual may be better at these than others. Um, the most applied mental rotation task I can usually think of is trying to follow IKEA furniture assembly directions, because that's essentially what you're doing, is you have to figure out what the picture looks like and then rotate the objects uh, to get them to match. In my own research, one of the things we have um, looked at is what's called spatial span. This is uh, an analog of what's called the Corsi block tapping task, in which participants are asked to remember a sequence of locations and then repeat that back. So what we did is we gave participants uh, a screen that looks like this, and then we asked them to remember the sequence in which uh, these light up or turn red. So watch this. then the participants would be asked to enter uh, the digits that they had just seen, or sorry, enter the digits you see here in the order in which those locations uh, were lit up or turned red. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to back all the way through these so you can kind of get the sense of looking at this again. Um, and what you'll be able to notice is as you try to uh, do this test yourself, so try this at home, try to rehearse these locations. So as these locations come up, you're going to try to remember which ones they are. So now you would then enter the sequence of digits. What you likely found yourself doing is directing your visual attention, if not even moving your eyes a bit, from one location to the other. It's a little bit like that game Simon that uh, was very popular a couple of times in my lifetime. Uh, so you're basically trying to remember those locations. We altered where these digits were on every trial I'm not so that... I'm quite sure how to help you with that. Hang on one sec. Sorry, my Amazon Echo was trying to talk to us. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so the <laughs> order of digits uh, would be different in each of these trials. So uh, that is a spatial span task. And what we see in uh, some neuroscience research is that uh, you can actually uh, see that this occurs, this kind of rehearsal occurs in the right hemisphere. And that seems to involve those visual attention areas that are part of like the, the uh, dorsal stream we talked about uh, previously. And so the visual spatial sketchpad seems to be primarily uh, in interacting with those visual attention areas uh, where uh, attention could be directed to uh, different areas. So that is uh, our brief introduction to the visual spatial sketchpad. In our next lecture, we'll be talking about uh, the central executive. <laughs>